Today I'm going to be talking about Serge Gainsbourg's 1971 masterpiece Histoire de Melody Nelson, this album here. And I was actually in France recently on holiday and I revisited this album. It's long been one of my favourites and I thought it might be interesting to make a little video about it. And I want to try something a little bit different. I thought rather than give you a guitar tutorial on a specific track, I thought I could give you a personal appreciation of the entire album. And I'm going to talk about the history and the recording and then take you on a quick tour of some of my personal favourite guitar highlights. Now, if you've not heard this record before, I do urge you to go out and listen to it immediately. It's actually quite hard to put into words exactly what it is. It is a concept album of sorts and there is a loose story to it and there are thematic elements which recur throughout the album. And I suppose musically speaking, it's a combination of this kind of funky, loose rhythm section. And then over the top of that, you've got these majestic strings and choirs from Jean-Claude Vanier. And then over the top of that, of course, you've got Serge Gainsbourg's mostly spoken word vocals. And I think with a lot of Serge Gainsbourg stuff, it's actually quite difficult to get into if you're not a French speaker. He was a, a poet and there's a lot of wordplay, a lot of filthy jokes, a lot of stuff that will just go straight over the top of your head if you're not speaking the language. But I think it's slightly different with this album. It is a very accessible album, even if you haven't got a clue what he's on about, just because the music is so strong and just that the tone and the delivery of Serge's voice is great, even if you don't know exactly what it is he's saying. The album was recorded in three stages and the initial phase, if you like, was recording the rhythm section, so bass, guitar and drums. And that was done in London at the Philips studio at Stanhope Place, right near Hyde Park. And then after a break of a few weeks, the tapes were taken to Paris where the choir and the strings were overdubbed under the supervision of Jean-Claude Vanier. And then there was a longer break and then finally the, the vocals were put down by, by Serge and uh, Jane Birkin. Interestingly, I think most of the lyrics were written after those initial sessions. So Serge had a chance to listen to the recordings and take inspiration from the atmosphere of them. And uh, that was what uh, inspired the story that you hear on the final album. And I suppose one of the ironies here, and I wasn't aware of this when I first heard the record, is that this most French sounding of records was actually partly made in London with a bunch of British session musicians. And there's been a lot of mystery about exactly who played on this record. And there are no credits on the sleeve, and that's not in itself unusual. I don't think session players generally weren't credited and there were no records made at the time. And I think for the players who played on the record, it was just another session date and they had uh, you know, little idea how this record was going to go on to become this you know, important and iconic thing. And there's been a lot of speculation and misinformation. And in fact, the Wikipedia page for the album is quite spectacularly wrong in a couple of places. And it was assumed for a long time, I think, that those amazing bass lines were played by the great Herbie Flowers of uh, you know, Elton John, uh, Lou Reed, David Bowie fame. He played the Walk on the Wild Side bass line, but I don't think it was him playing bass on this record. And likewise, with the guitar parts, there are three guitar players credited on the Wikipedia page and uh, people are saying it was Vic Flick, also famous for doing the James Bond theme, or perhaps Big Jim Sullivan, who was another famous session player from the time. But I think it now has more or less been confirmed exactly who played in that original rhythm section. And uh, I'm getting my information from this uh, amazing book here. It's called uh, Le Gaines Book, which is an absolutely uh, amazing book, absolutely essential if you're a fan of Serge Gaines. But unfortunately, I think it is only available in the French language. I can just about make some sense out of this. But I think even if you don't speak French, it's worth it just getting for the, for the pictures alone, which are um, absolutely incredible. And in this book, there are some pictures of the actual London session. And you can actually zoom in on some of these pictures. And in the background, you can see the, the bass player and the guitar player. And it has now been confirmed that the bass player was a man called Dave Richmond and he was a founding member of Manfred Mann and he went on to become a very prolific session player in the 60s and 70s and it was him providing those iconic bass lines and that was all played on a Burns Bison bass. And then the guitarist was a man called Alan Parker, another very prolific session player. He played with Donovan, also played with Bowie. Allegedly he actually played the Rebel Rebel riff on the Bowie record. What record was that? Oh, was it Diamond? dogs I think but uh, another incredible session player and this book tells me that he played all of the Melody Nelson guitar parts so all of the electric and acoustic parts there were no other guitar players involved 
in the sessions and he even talks about the gear that he used on the sessions and the electric parts were all played on a Les Paul I think it was a 64 Les Paul through a Fender Deluxe amp and then the acoustic parts were played on a Martin D45 so it's brilliant after all these years to finally get some definitive information about exactly who played on this record although we still don't know for sure who was the drummer I think it's likely that it was a man called Barry Morgan but there's still a little bit of uncertainty about that in the the, the, the Gaines book it just says drums probably played by Barry Morgan so I suppose we're never going to know for sure so what I want to do now is just run through the album track by track and along the way I'm going to be pointing out a few of my favourite guitar moments. I'm not necessarily going to be giving you a, a note for note tutorial of this stuff. It is quite a loose and jammy sounding recording but I'm certainly going to be showing you a few of these licks and uh, one of the great things I think you can get from studying an album like this in some detail is just taking inspiration from how someone like Alan Parker, a master session player, is able to come up with these you know, definitive kind of iconic parts and atmospheres. And that's something that I find really inspiring and you can certainly kind of steal some of the ideas and concepts that he's using on this record. The opening track is just called Melody and it's about how our protagonist, our narrator, first meets Melody Nelson. He's cruising around in his Rolls Royce Silver Ghost and uh, he seems to become I guess kind of mesmerised by the, the little statuette on the bonnet, the spirit of ecstasy as it's known. And uh, then he eventually accidentally crashes into uh, the young Melody Nelson who's riding a bicycle. And uh, musically speaking, it's an amazing track. It really sets out the atmosphere of the entire album. And the first thing you hear is that amazing bass line. And then the drums creep in and they're really dry and softly played. Then you've got the guitar and the vocals. And then by the end of the track, the whole thing is really built and you've got the strings on top. Musically speaking, this one is based on a simple four chord cycle. And the chords are E, G, D and A. And uh, I'm going to come on to the guitar part in just a moment, but I, I can't not show you how to play this iconic opening bass line. I'm not really a bass player or a bass teacher, but I just have to show you this because it's uh, so good. So the, the basic riff goes like this. And you can hear that those four chords are being outlined, but it's being done in a really inventive, uh, creative kind of a way. So we're starting off with the root note of the opening chord, which is an E. So just playing the, the open low E string. And then we've got a bend. So just bending at the 12th fret here on the top string. I do like bends on bass guitar. I don't think you hear enough bending being done on bass guitars, but it sounds so cool. And then we're hitting the root note of the next chord, which is a G, but we're approaching that G note from one fret above. So it's 11 to 10 on the A string. And then we've got open D string. That's the root note of the next chord in the cycle. Another bend, and this time it's a bend at the 10th fret on the top string. And then we're hitting the root note of the next chord, which is the A. Again, approaching that from one fret away. So this time from one fret below, just sliding into it. So that, that's the basic idea. It just kind of goes around like that. There are some variations and then the whole bass line develops as the track goes on. But it's such a good bass line. I think if you are a bass player then uh, it's no bad idea to try learning the entire seven minute bass line. I think you get so much out of studying it. It's just so good. As far as the guitar parts go on this opening track we're really just starting off quite simply just jamming around those four basic chords. So we've got E, G, D and A and just playing those basic open position chord shapes but it's done in a nice kind of rhythmic funky kind of a way. There are a few nice little fills thrown in there. Particularly like that little idea at the end of the phrase there, it's just a pentatonic fill, so... And 
and then uh, other little feels really just with the D shape little hammer on and pull off on the top string and really just dividing the chords between the bass notes and the higher notes for, for accents so muted low notes and then some higher accents time I think just being conscious of dynamics it's a super dynamic track so you can play really softly and then in the particularly intense passages you can really dig in and go for some more kind of out there and dissonant stuff another prominent feature of this track is the use of unison bends so this kind of thing now, I'm sure you know uh, the technique I'm just playing a double stop here but I'm bending a note up to match the pitch of uh, another fretted note on the next string over and you get that nice kind of dissonant sound where the two notes are kind of fighting against each other a little bit. So one thing you hear on this track is a, a nice series of descending unison bends. So. And what else have we got? We've got some nice bluesy improvised licks very much in the Jimi Hendrix kind of a vein I think so this one is particularly nice um... so for the next track the ballad of Melody Nelson we're going acoustic and it's got this lovely arpeggiated guitar part and it goes something like this <laughs> This one starting off with a lovely part played in unison with the bass that goes something like this. And then ending with some kind of D major seventh chord. Then we're into this arpeggiated part. Uh, all of these arpeggios played on the top four strings. You could hold down bigger bar chord shapes if you want to, but I'm only really hearing the top four strings. We're starting with F sharp minor. The picking pattern that I'm hearing goes like this. And that's fairly consistent through all of the chords. I think it might not always be exactly that. It's a little bit hard to hear sometimes with all the strings over the top, but this certainly works well. So F sharp minor, F sharp minor seven. So B minor. Back to F sharp minor. F sharp minor 7, then D before we go back again to F sharp minor. Now this is nice, we're going up to this shape here, which is actually another inversion of F sharp minor. And then I think the bass note changes, um, just, just played by the bass guitar, the, the, the guitar stays the same, but that's it's going from F sharp minor to a D major 7 and then this is kind of a D flat minor 7 and then down to here E flat minor 7 D again and then we're back to the riff again so a um, really nice part of that really nice the the different voicings the different inversions being used here it's a really smooth part just kind of choosing the, the the voicings to connect together in a really kind of a musical way the next track Vals de Melody I think contains one of Serge Gainsbourg's most beautiful vocal melodies and this one is very much string led there is some quite minimal guitar but it's a little bit hard to hear exactly which voicings are being played just because it's kind of buried underneath the strings. But the basic chord progression is something like this.
nice jazzy chord progression there. It's just in the key of C minor, got C minor going to uh, A flat major seven, and then G seven. It's that kind of cycle, which is the verse of the tune. This one, our melody, obviously very similar in vibe to the ballad of Melody Nelson. The guitar part is almost identical. It's those arpeggios on the top four strings. It's the same finger style kind of pattern. The chord progression is different and it's a really beautiful chord progression. This one starts off with a G major chord. And this is changing really smoothly to an E flat. Major, so this is where knowledge of uh, chord voicings, chord inversions is really helpful. You just get that nice, smooth change, great kind of voice leading between those shapes. And then we've got D minor, and then going to D flat major again, using that, that same shape just to get a smooth change from the D minor to the D flat major and then we've got F major and then it just goes round again really beautiful chord progression. The next track, Hotel Particulier, is a lovely, a slow building, tense track, mostly just based on a pair of chords. So it's A minor going to kind of a D with an A in the bass. And the, the basic feeling of it is something like this. We've got... So we're starting off just with some low A notes, fifth fret on the, the, the low E string. And then you've got a couple of ways you can play the chords here. You can play them up here. I've got an A minor seven just barring at the fifth fret and then the seventh fret on the A. And then playing the, the D over A like this. I've got open A string and I've got my D triad and you, you could hold down the, the high B note as well so I'm just kind of jamming around those two chords you could slide into those chords a little bit uh, or you could play the chords down at this end of the neck so just a, a regular open A minor chord maybe hammering on with the the first finger hearing this chord which is really nice so it's, uh, I suppose it's, it's kind of a D6 uh, but you've got that A note in the bass so it's open open two open and two and then we're going to this is a F major seven it's taking that shape up two frets. It's uh, kind of a, a G chord, but you've got that, that uh, top E string in there as well. And then back to A minor. The penultimate track on melody, and this is more of a up-tempo kind of funk 
jam again mostly based on a couple of chords and it's got this amazing kind of signature lick in it which i'm going to have to show you how to play that's the lick that goes like this amazing lick i'm going to have to play that again it's a so it's another one of these unison bends so here i'm at the the 11th fret and the eighth fret and then I've got a bend at the eighth fret on the B and then a similar thing over on the G before coming down to this D note here, seventh fret on the G. So And then we're just into this kind of two chord funky jam and it's just B minor going to C minor, just going between those two chords. It's quite loosely played. There are some little fills thrown in. I think towards the end of the track, we've got some more kind of unison bend stuff. So it's, it's this kind of idea. And the final track, Cargo Cult, and this is where Melody dies in a plane crash on her way back to Sunderland. And musically speaking, it's a return to the main theme that you hear in the opening track. So the album is kind of bookended by a similar kind of feeling. And uh, it's that same four chord progression that I spoke about earlier. So the E, G, D and A. And guitar wise, a lot of similar devices are being used as the first time round. I do particularly like the use of feedback in this one and there's this single note line which is just going down and it's feeding back but it's not kind of wild out of control feedback it's really kind of musically done it's just kind of starting to feed back so uh, I'm just going to turn up loud for uh, a moment and just see if I can approximate what's going on there so uh... Also a really nice breakdown section where the chords are something like this. And then there's a nicely chaotic ending, so lots more of this kind of unison bending stuff, this kind of wild bluesy soloing and these kind of open strings as well. So it's And there we have it. That was a quick tour through some of my favourite Melody Nelson guitar bits. Hope you found this video interesting. Hope maybe you've taken some inspiration from some of these great guitar parts. And uh, let me know what you think of this format. Perhaps I could do a similar kind of thing with another classic album. And uh, if so, let me know if you've got any thoughts about which albums would uh, work well for this kind of thing. Thanks very much for watching. I will be tabbing out some of these licks and ideas. Those will be up on my Patreon page and I'll see you next week for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.